Our next speaker will be Dr. Jonas D'Souza. Uh, Dr. D'Souza is a Buxbaum faculty scholar and an assistant professor of medicine in the section of hematology oncology. Um, Jonas's research focuses on the use of pharmaceuticals to treat cancer, uh, looking at outcomes, patient preferences, and the economics of clinical practice. Today's talk will be entitled, Financial Distress of Cancer Patients. Jonas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with a very easy question. Who thinks that cancer is expensive? Great. So we're all on the same page. My mom used to tell me that to fix a problem, first you have to recognize there's a problem. So we're all on the same page. So here, this was not on purpose. I was planning to do that even before I knew who the speaker was. Um, I hope this is a good picture that I can use. In 2012, Dr. Ubel wrote in New England this commentary. Basically, many patients in the United States experience substantial harm from medical interventions whose risks have not been fully disclosed or discussed. The undisclosed toxicity, high cost, which can cause considerable financial strain. So I hope I read it well. <laughs> now, so the whole talk today is about, not about the expensive, uh, how expensive cancer care is, but basically how our patients view that, how expensive it is for them, right? So just to give uh, one slide on this, there is this data that was published last year on an oncology journal. Basically, patients, cancer survivors will ask, to what degree cancer caused financial problems for you and your family? Was, there were about 2,000 patients from a big national house income survey. So it's one of the largest surveys of cancer patients. And basically about 30% of patients out of 2,100 said, cancer survivors, that had issues, financial issues. And about 9% of those, they had a lot, the blue bar of financial issues. So again, we are fine. We recognize we have a problem. There are people talking about it. Dr. Hugo, Dr. Yusuf Zafar, Aduk, right? Our group here, we are talking about it. So now how can we go the next step, right? Right now, all that we have to measure is basically do these qualitative interviews, a lot, a little. So basically, we want to try to develop a metric to try to follow this patient through the treatment, before and after. Has it changed? Uh, can we predict where the, who the patients who will have the toxicity are, right? Can we try to link the these financial out-of-pocket costs or financial distress to clinically meaningful outcomes, to call out of life or to survival, uh, survivors? So here in the University of Chicago, basically about three years ago, we've been doing this research, and we developed a patient report on outcome in 155 patients. We interviewed uh, uh, about 150 patients, just to come up with 11 <coughs> questions. And this was done with supervision or with mentorship with people from Northwestern, David Sella, who does a lot of quality of life studies. And we developed this patient reported outcome that we named COST, Comprehensive Score for Financial Toxicity. I'm not gonna read all the questions, but basically it's 11 item uh, patient reported outcome that goes from not at all to very much. I know I have enough money in savings and retirement assets to cover the cost of my treatment. We developed this. So that was the first step. We developed an instrument to try to quantify, to score this toxicity. First step done. Now the second step that we had, we went back to the clinic. Now we interviewed about 230 patients with this patient report outcome, now showing them our other instruments, depression instruments, quality of life instruments, other financial questions about their out-of-pockets, um, some demographics income, how many times they have been hospitalized, how many times they've gone to the ER. And our goal here was basically trying, again, to correlate our measure of financial distress to a clinical, clinical and meaningful measure. So there is a really widely used quality of life instrument called FACT, that, is, uh, that was developed by somebody in Northwestern. And we know on that instrument, basically what is a good normal, uh, good quality of life, or this patient had a significant decrease 
in quality of life. This patient had a mild, significant decrease in quality of life. We can gra uh, grade this, right? And the whole idea was, how can we try to correlate our financial burden or financial stress, financial toxicity score, to a quality of life instrument, right? How can we transform what we have in a clinically meaningful instrument that we can tell the patients that, well, with this score, you have no impact in your quality of life. With this score, you have a minimum, uh, very mild grade one impact in your quality of life. With this score, we have a very high grade three impact on the quality of life. So that's basically what we did in these 230 patients, where we gave a lot of a battery of surveys, quality of life, demographic, cost, a lot of things. So basically, you know, just to summarize here what you're gonna, what is the minute for one of the minutes now. Controlling for demographics, resource utilizations, and measurable symptoms. Patients of group one had a small and minimum effect. Group two, statistically significant medium effect size. And grade three, a lot of change in the quality of life. So we came up with a score, and we were able to come up with cutoffs for the score. Between these and these, you have no <laughs> toxicity. There's no impact in the quality of life when you control for all these other variables. Between these and these, there's a lot of impact in the quality of life. So we're able to create a meaningful, clinically meaningful um, score for patients uh, in, in related to their financial distress. Just another finding that we had, there was a significant relationship between financial toxicity, grades one and three, mild, moderate, and high, in younger age, non Caucasians, less than a college degree, unemployment, Medicaid. And that's what you expected. So it showed that it measures what we wanted to measure. And just to show uh, what we had in our uh, our little uh, cohort of patients at the University of Chicago, Grade zero, well, no distress about 99 patients. Grade one, uh, about 31% of patients. Grade two, 25%. And grade three, a lot, about 3% of patients. And here at the bottom, that's how the NCI, the National Cancer Institutes, used to name or to grade, to grade their toxicities, hair loss, neurotoxicity, anything, right? Grade zero, none. Grade one, mild, asymptomatic or mild symptoms. Clinical diagnostic observations only, interventions not needed. Grade two, moderate, minimal, local non-invasive intervention indicated. Grade three, severe or medically significant but not immediately life-threatening. Uh, you cannot see the last line here, but it basically consider change of therapy. And that's what you're starting to think about. Should we start thinking about if the patient has a large decrease in their quality of life related to financial distress? Should we start talking about maybe next time when I switch the regimen, I should do something else, or these kind of things. Now, how I got involved with the Bucks Baum Institute was basically that now we are developing a financial toxicity or financial distress registry here in the of Chicago. With our uh, IT people, we are developing a website. And within, within this website, patients can find information on this, and patients can also fill out our survey find out their score, find out where they are compared to patients on my database. Uh, just the idea was like I have a two-year-old baby, I take to the pediatrician, and every time, oh, she is on the ninth, fifth percent, percentile of weight. And that's kind of what I was planning to. And I try to tell patients, based on these, you are on the 50th percentile of financial distress, maybe you should talk to your doctor about this symptom. Let's make this, let's increase awareness of, uh, of this symptom. Talk to your doctor. So just to give a, a, a broader uh, conclusion here, or patients feel the pain of costs, we need to measure this pain, right? And that's also for uh, Dr. Bell. How should we discuss, should we disclose this cost to patients? And how should they be discussed? Should, they, should we disclose the costs themselves? Should we, discuss, should we disclose a little bit what I'm doing? Uh, based on the on, on, on these, you ha you have a mild impact in a quality of life. Instead of talking about twenty thousand dollars, talking about there may be a, an impact in a quality of life, and we should learn who these patients are. This was a, just a, a very brief overview of our research. A lot of people have to thank to who have been helping us in making this possible. Thank you, the Bucks Institute, for this helping us. <laughs>